guys, we're going to go ahead and start. Everybody grab the handouts back there. One of them should be uh, the when do you, what do you do when you worry all the time by Jay Adams. This is another great pamphlet of his. Um, I want to point out one of the uh, things that he mentions in here that I, as you can see, mine's all highlighted and notes and all of that on the pamphlet because it's got some really stuff, really good stuff in it. Um, he talks about at one point in there, when you are suffering with worrying, ask yourself these three questions. He lists those there. Like stop, take a minute to ask yourself these questions, and then it'll kind of help guide you with your worry and like how to how to process it. Um, so it's just a good pamphlet to have, and certainly for yourselves, and definitely for counseling. So, um, and then another handout will be the discussion questions with the answers. And just remember to hang on to those for those of you who are going to test out for level one. And can I encourage you guys that weren't thinking of testing out? It might be fun just to give it a try. <laughs> I always thought about that fun. with the bar exam. Could be fun to take a test. <laughs> You're called to recall. Okay, okay, that's great. <laughs> I know. See, I mean, I was in the least legal field for so long. I thought, you know. I, I thought, I, maybe I'll just try to take the bar exam, just see how it comes out. But it's pretty expensive, so I never did do it. But I thought, oh, that might be fun if we went. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. But, all right, so let me start off in prayer, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, well, Heavenly Father, we just praise you, and we thank you for your teachings, and, and certainly, you know, fellowship with you, Lord. We are aware of our weaknesses. Continue to make us aware of our weaknesses so that we can grow in our circumstances. Um, we're grateful for being recipients of your marvelous grace, and thank you for giving us the wisdom we do not possess ourselves. Um, minister to us through the text that we're going to be uh, reading today and the, and the video that we're going to be listening to today so that we can uh, grow in sanctification so that we can know you better, be more useful to you, Lord, and um, it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so you guys, today uh, there's some good news, and then, well, now you guys won't think it's fun when I have a plan, because <laughs> when I see the reaction. All right, so... Pop quiz, pop quiz. <laughs> this is going to be a blast. <laughs> Set your books, get out a piece of paper and pencil. <laughs> So everybody's in there taking that test, right? They're going to be laughing their heads off, thinking, Deborah said this was fun. All right, well, it's not, it's not really a test per se, but, um, but I just thought since the video is only 30 minutes today, uh, and I'm gonna, I, I want to talk a little bit about some stuff that Jim Newhazer doesn't speak about that I think is important, but I wanted to leave time for there to be some critical thinking exercises. So what I did was made up nine cases. And so Les is going to hand those out right after the video. And I, I planned on two to a case. And then you guys read the case. And I gave a list of questions of what I'm looking for out of you all as potential counselors or even one another people, you know, counseling. Um, and you won't be able to answer all the questions, but you should be able to answer quite a few of the questions. And on the back side, they're blank, right, Les, where they can sure. write everything out. <laughs> and if you'll put your names. Now, what I thought we'd do is those who feel competent enough to read their case and talk about the critical thinking they were doing, we do that, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> rather not, I would still like to take them home to see who's getting what. You know, how she did this after we go around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have my certificate. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. And I will not, um, you know, shake my finger at any of you if, you if 
if not one of you wants to be able to talk about you know, your case, but I'm hoping somebody will, because some of them are a little more difficult than others, so those of you maybe that get the easier cases, maybe, might be willing, we'll see. All right, so you guys, today is on worry, and, or on anxiety and worry. Um, one question, so who can tell me what noetic counseling is? Noetic counseling. <laughs> Mary, Mary's like, I know you said this last week. What did you say? It's something about, I can never remember the exact word, but it's something about counseling that deals with the heart and the sin in it. Right. Okay, so it is counseling the effects of sin on the mind, will, and emotions. That's what noetic counseling is. That's what this counseling is. It's biblical counseling. It's straight out of the Bible. If you... If, if, if someone comes to you and they're looking for talk therapy, this isn't it. If somebody comes to you and they're looking for medication, this isn't it. This is straight out of the Bible. Um, you know, we've taught on the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual how, uh, of Mental Disorders. Um, you know, it's great for uh, descriptions of certain words and illnesses, but it sucks at prescriptions. And that's why, anybody, can anybody tell me why? <coughs> Because it doesn't handle the spiritual side of issues. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I want you to understand that anxiety and worry has kissing cousins, which is fear and anger. So usually where you'll see one, you'll see the others. One will just be more prevalent than the others. All right. And some, some anxiety can be life dominating. Remember the case I shared with you about the young lady that um, uh, could not leave her home because she, the, the fear of this deadly germ, and she wanted her parents to build a um, sanitation building at the front entrance of their home, and everyone that came through was supposed to go through the sanitation station. Mm -hmm. So, like that was the level of fear. Uh, and also, remember I told you that a bumblebee almost ran me off the cliff, <laughs> a 200 drop cliff, because fear is blinding, is blinding. So these are all emotions that are useful. You know, God put them in us, they're useful for the right reasons, but also they can be very harmful, and that's what we want to talk about today. So, um, and certainly we're seeing that the old temptation for Adam and Eve has simply been repackaged and updated for the day today. We're immersed in a culture that idolizes individuality, autonomy, self-expression, self-definition, and worship of self wants and desires. So where you see one of these four emotions, you're probably gonna likely see the others. They're all closely related. Uh, I was telling the pastor earlier today, they're kissing cousins. Anxiety usually involves worrying about what could possibly happen Fear goes a step further and is more convinced that what is dreaded will happen. Um, and it's important to remember, uh, concern and fear are not always wrong. There is a godly concern where you genuinely care about a person's soul and an ungodly concern, which is anxiety. There's a godly righteous fear and an ungodly self-righteous fear. When someone experiences apprehension that does not stay within the biblical bounds, there is definitely a lack of trust and thus a lack of peace. Godly concern is caring about important things for the right reasons, and it's accompanied by a trust in God's ultimate control and faithfulness. That's the kind of concern that helps you to be responsible to God. It will involve a focus on the responsibilities of the day, your spiritual growth, the love of others, Godly concern in the New Testament, it references Paul's concern for the churches, Timothy's concern for the Philippians' welfare. For our concern to be the right kind, you have to be focused on what's true and helpful from God's perspective. Well, in the scriptures, in Corinthians 12, what's that purpose? It's so that there will be no division among the body, that the members may have the same godly care one for another. Ungodly concern, which is anxiety, goes beyond reasonable concern and involves worry about mere possibilities. And worry about mere possibilities can turn into fearful imaginations. And I have counseled for that very thing, fearful imaginations, and because 
it causes so much stress in a relationship and certainly in a marriage. And um, you have to take them to scripture and show them that that's just a lack of trust. I mean, the scriptures tell us it's impossible to please God without faith, so it's a lack of faith. Uh, when we're anxious, we're often concerned that something we want to happen may not happen. Focuses on potential difficulties and the future of self. All right, so I mentioned earlier uh, the case that I shared with you guys about the young lady who wanted the sanitation building in front of the entrance of their home. Those were self, what I call self-imposed laws. So by that, I mean she had to have, um, you know, that was something she was imposing on her, on her parents and on herself instead of uh, seeing how God viewed her lack of faith and her lack, lack of trust and her worries and her anxieties. And, um, so I want to talk a little bit more about self-imposed laws. Mostly that's caused by status anxieties. So do you all know what I mean by that? It's, you know, fear of man. You guys have had some teachings on fear of man. Um, this falls right in line with what the preacher was teaching us in Philippians. In Philippians 3, Paul confronts Judaizers who claim that circumcision is necessary to gain a righteous status before God, placing their trust in the flesh and their works rather than the eternal status accomplished and granted to them through Christ. So... Sometimes you can have people that come in and, and they'll, they'll tell you things like, um, they kind of put themselves in a legalistic trap. They're kind of like, well, I have to marry, we have, this was an actual case, I have to marry a beautiful woman. The man is 65 years old and still not married, but that was his self-imposed law. Um, I must be financially secure by my mid-30s. That would be, I must, I'm not saying that these aren't good goals, yeah. But when they turn into, um, like I, I think I got an example here, they get even more specific than that. Once the self-imposed laws are made, then they get more specific, like, oh, I must work 16 hours a day. Now, now their kids suffer, their family suffers. So see what I mean? It just kind of has a ripple effect when you start living legalistically. Um, so you really have to discern, you know, what those are, what your, what your worries are, what your goals are. There has to be a division line there. Uh, they have to be balanced. Initially, these desires may have been influenced by your parents or even social influences, but over time, these desires become a self-imposed law and they enslave a person's heart. As we've been learning, desires can morph into a sin and in some cases, life-dominating sins. And what I should have put there more clearly is our responses to those emotions. Those emotions are all normal. It's our response to them that can be sinful. I want to make that clear. Uh, and so what people do is they end up making these laws and they end up feeling defeated because, because they can't attain them. They can't keep that perfect type of life going, you know. Um, our potential is always in Christ. It's what brings deliverance and peace. Uh, in Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, it says, The steadfast mind we will keep in perfect peace with the steadfast mind because we trust in him that he is our rock. And that's so true. So spoiler alert, the rock is not Dwayne Johnson. It's our, it's our heavenly father. All right, Caleb, let's go ahead with this. When we talk about worry and anxiety, um. You know, they always have to get that in, don't you? They sell the books <laughs> and the pamphlets and all that. Um, and another good assignment is if you're counseling somebody with anxiety or worry, fear, anger even, um, it's great to uh, give some like open-ended questions like, um, I would stop worrying if, and then have them fill out an entire paragraph, you know, and finishing that sentence. Um, I would stop being fearful if, because when you begin to read all that, it, it, it will show you uh, the motives and intents of the heart, and you find it, and you try to decide whether or not that's in line with God's word, and that's the direction that you take them. And he's talking about people with uncertainty, this young lady that wanted to build that sanitation room in front of the uh, front door of her parents' home. That's what her, that was her idol. She, it was idolatry. She was so 
everything, she had to be certain about everything. Everything had to be, um, she had to know everything. So, and so I had to start with showing her that she's basically, you know, asking God to get off the throne and let her be, be there, you know. Even right down to Diane, I had to take her to that scripture where it says that, you know, only God's aware of which, when each man is appointed to die and just stuff like that, that you have to work through. All right, well, so, ladies, do you want to stay for the um, getting in a group and, and do some critical thinking? Or yeah. <laughs> she, She's like, no. <laughs> we got more folks that were coming in. Okay. okay. So we All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to All right. Yeah, I'm hoping that you guys will not do husband and wife teams. <laughs> We'll be with somebody smart who will break us up. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and open them. And then what you'll do is you'll find the person who's holding your color, the same color, you get with that person. So Hold up your colors, everybody. <laughs> I can't wait till next week. There's probably a lot, probably a lot of take the test. Thanks for the Go hook up the bars to it. Show this if we tell a lot. Shannon, this is not uncommon for a teacher to do a pop something around that, is it? Oh, no. Let me get the last one. Oh, he is? No. Last Caleb. Oh, okay. Caleb? So get with the person who has your color. <laughs> oh, you're with Ginger. Jamie, yes. what color do you get? Ginger blue? I Oh, my God. Is that the same? I'm personally with you. I don't want to do it. I don't want hurt anybody's feelings by getting crazy with Italian, you know? So I tried to be careful about it. Because people are so funny today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys, on the back is where you'll put what questions you would ask the counselee, what direction you think you should be heading with the counselee, um, you know, whatever questions on there that you're choosing to answer for your specific case. Uh, write all of that out on the back because what I'm hoping for is to see what you guys are picking up and what I might need to focus in on. More. That's what this is about. There's no right or wrong. It's just how can I be a better, you know, facilitator. So. And so I hate for you to feel guilty over what I write down. That's what you teach me, though. I do bear some responsibility. <laughs> So what is the outcome? What are we supposed to actually do? So you're, you're, you're pretending like you're a counselor, and you're going to write out exactly how you would handle that case with the information you hold as of today. Individually, although we both have the same? Yeah, well, you might want to both go the same direction, maybe not, but that's what you'll write on your paper. Yeah. Things go in a big way. I want names and questions. Names and questions. So write your names on the back so I can see who's done what. Yeah.
Yeah, because it, like you guys will each write your name on your own, okay. and maybe the other person would have gone in a different direction or asked different questions, but yet you guys might have been better. It is a, it is a team, but you you know you're they're, you're not going to have the same thoughts on questions and things. <laughs> You don't want to. <laughs> it won't be great, is it? And if you guys do, like, if you're talking to Mary and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll go that way, well, then, then you guys are working together. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's That's the kind of stuff I'm And if you do, Like to give you a little bit of a hint, if you see something that, like one of the cases says, well, I drink occasionally. See, all of these things should be red flags. Yes. Like, what's occasionally to this? How often? Is it, are they spending a lot of money, a lot of time at the bar? These are the questions I'm looking for. The things that you guys pick up on. Okay, so we're going down to I don't propose if you want something for him, he wants everything to go straight to me. So when the car doesn't work, he's at something to call because he wants to. Yeah, we should actually. 
I don't know if there's space to put it in. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, that's
modern luxuries of like vehicles, perhaps they need to Okay, um, this is something I'll try to go to. It is a fast only practice, but you guys are going to need to step back from this for a season while my, while my kids are playing sports or, you know, while these things are happening. That's also true. Yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. that are given, I think he needs to put more effort into the home life because uh, neither side, it almost feels like they've danced this dance before. Like, this is the first time they've been good. Yeah. So I think he needs to put more effort into the home life. Yeah. Obviously, it doesn't deal with the heart, but it can help some of the symptoms and allow you to focus more on the heart. Thank you. 
Although he is a comedian, he suffers quietly from a deep insecurity. His reviews are dropping. His manager is telling him he is distracted and not doing a good job anymore, so he's worried about being dropped. He's in great debt, as this career is not always a lucrative one. A large amount of his income is going to buy alcohol, 
in addition to what he's provided during his performances. He has shared with his pastor about his exhaustion and with his need to be on all the time. So, Ginger, feel free to add if I miss it. So Ginger and I, after talking about it, um, talked about how we would praise him for going to church, for being involved in church, for going to his pastor, um, in, in talking about it, not just continuing to quietly, you know, try, to, yes, <laughs> yes. try and get through it himself. Um, some of the deeper questions we wanted to ask is uh, why he's feeling insecure, kind of delve into that, what does that mean? Um, where his debt came from, um, kind of a, does he even know how to live within his means sort of idea, or is it a means of escape that he's using, and that's how he's accrued debt. Um, why so much is spent on alcohol? Why are we going to alcohol? Is it, is it also an escape? Um, what does it mean to be on all the time? Um, and is there anybody you can let your guard down with? Do you have any true community in your church or anywhere? Um, I think that was it. Did I get them all? So those are the questions. Um, as far as hope, we talked about taking him to 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 to reassure him he can lay his cares down before Almighty God. Um, and then maybe to Psalm 139 to remind him that God knows him fully already. Um, and so again, kind of addressing those insecurities um, that he doesn't, he's fearfully and wonderfully made kind of idea. Um, as far as life changes, I think it was. We were going to talk about the, the drinking, especially if it's a means of escape, and eventually the debt, but maybe start, you know, as we're probing mm -hmm. into the insecurities and things, maybe start on those tangible things as well, um, depending on how we answer <laughs> the questions and things. And then, and then in continued counseling, um, I don't know if we talked about this, I said I would have him memorize First Peter 5, 6, and 7, and maybe start a prayer journal. Just start writing down his prayers as a practice of you know, physically laying his anxieties out um, before God and, and getting used to that practice. Really good. Mm -hmm. Anything else to do? No, I think you're wrong. Yeah, okay, what I picked up on the most that she found was you definitely want to ask him, what did he mean by being on all the time because as everyone sitting here knows Robin R Williams who was a comedian um, committed suicide and if you look at even listen to some of Jim Carrey's interviews the stress of having to be on all the time liked by people especially when they rely on that for a living is too much for some people so that was really good all right Ashton yeah, read our Responses, but then in his whole initial sin, there's lying, deceit, and so 
pretentious. Um, allowed that to even take place. Like, what's yeah. going on in that, in their relationship as brother and sister? And, and then yeah. our action items, I'm sorry, is that what you were going to get to? Like, so, yeah, know Jesus and walk with him, and um, you know, make reconciliation, make restitution, be suggested having, making a longness, like, listing all the things that he did to Lily and his mother, he did more than just take money. He, I mean, one of the long-lasting effects is that he deceived their father to think ill of her before he died. So right. she has to live with the fact that her father right. not only gave his inheritance to the son, but his blessing. So basically died with that thought of her. You know? Yeah, a lot of so, deep offenses. Yeah. Yeah, so she's got a lot of hurt there. Her heart is talking about him definitely uh, needing to be patient and willing to uh, apologize and, and make restitution even if she's not accepting mm -hmm. that you know, she's free, if she has a hard time with it or whatever, just really realizing the debt of what you did. Yeah, like some of the classes that we've been talking about, when, when you you know repent, we're supposed to list out the things that we are so remorseful for. And that's what I think makes uh, conflict resolution so much easier mm -hmm. is when those are listed the other person that's been offended understands you know that they understand all the hurts so I, I like that that's good all right now who uh, Jenny are you reading Minnie Mouse is a 56 year old single woman she currently works for medical share insurance and has worked from home for the last two years she does not have a good relationship with her mother, who is 85 years old, a drunkard most of Minnie's life, and lives in another state. She states that her mother is new age. When asked what that means, she stated, she reads tarot cards and professes to be a psychic. Minnie's father died when she was two. Minnie accepted Christ at the age of 40. Before giving her life to Christ, she turned to several men looking for love. Minnie was engaged to a man named Mickey for many years, but due to her periodic substance abuse, he broke up with her. Minnie then sought secular counseling for sobriety. She sought out a psychiatrist named Dr. Stevenson. She has been struggling with low self-esteem most of her life. She does communicate on occasion with her sister, who lives in Missouri. Her brother is a Buddhist, so she does not have a relationship with him. She stated that she feels the devil whispers in her ear that she will be isolated and alone forever. Medication, let's approach, and this has been for 10 years. towards her 
her mother. She doesn't really go into that, but yeah. um, worry, anxiety, fear, and depression, definitely. Yeah. Um, about being alone. And, um, yeah, definitely family relationships is bad um, for her, which, you know, brings instability and, um, you know, like she was looking for love through, you know, different relationships. And so she's looked in the wrong place for, you know, for love. So what kind of questions would you ask her? Um, well, backing up a little bit, it says evangelism be needed. And it says that she has been a believer since the age of 40, but it doesn't seem that she's had a lot of biblical teaching. Uh, Okay, that's good, because that, that's what I wanted you to pick up on. And that, that's why sometimes you have to have them clarify, mm -hmm. you know, their salvation. Talk to them a lot about salvation, how they see it. So that was, that was a good... That so was a good the point. questions are, are you in the church? Do you um, read and study your Bible? Do you believe the Bible, the whole Bible? Right, 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 right. And you can identify Yeah. It, I, it's not a simple response, but it can that response can lead to sin. It certainly doesn't seem to be helping. R right. Like there, it's not productive. Mm -hmm. It's not productive. And so people that isolate, um, and usually the times that I hear that the most is when I counsel for addiction. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing they'll isolate. And a lot of them, because they uh, have not come out about their struggle with addiction, so you have that going on. And yeah, certainly if she's feeling like she's not good with relationships, yeah, I, I just, it's just bad, especially with the internet today, that's just bad. So yeah, it sounds like you guys picked up on some good things. She definitely needs to work on her relationship with God and feel like her relationship with other people are gonna fill that. Right, fill, fill that void, yeah. All right, anything else? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, and this one, particular person was on, on that kind of prep. Uh, and when you get that information, I've been reading so much about the antidepressant narcotics. Um, this is so bad for me. Is, is, do you ever try to get them off? I know I've been asked that. I think Ashton asked me that too one time. And that's that's I have had them come into me and say um, I've been prescribed. I started out prescribed this one when it kind of wasn't working. I got prescribed this one when that wasn't working. Now I've been prescribed. All right, then since that's what they brought to me, then that's uh, my job as a counselor to try to help them in that way. But unless they come to me and say, I want to cut this down, and I always immediately involve their physician, always involve their physician. But yeah, if that's what they're wanting, then you know, then we can do that. So because why? Because do you know of negative effects, especially over prolonged periods? Yeah, it starts to affect the it, yeah, it starts to affect the body for one thing. Um, this one lady that was on several of them, along with other medications, and, and it gets so complicated because this particular lady I'm thinking about, she would doctor shop. Mm. Yeah, and so one doctor didn't know what the other doctor was prescribing, and she got real good at that. And now that we have, in Florida, there, is there a drug monitoring system in Florida? Yes, okay, so I think that's gotten a lot better, but that used to be real bad when there wasn't a drug monitoring system. Um, so, but if I see that it's just like a, the lowest dose, and that's not why they're in there, they're, they, you know, they're in for other things, then I usually don't address that. I'll ask, uh, are, those, are you still on them? Are they working? Have they been increased or decreased at any time? So you get some kind of idea about you know, how it's affecting them and, and 
you know, which way they want to go. You know, consideration too is if the drugs were working or if their practitioner that's prescribing those drugs, if, if that whole system was working, they wouldn't be sitting across the desk from you. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for something because they're not getting relief anyplace else. Mary, what did you start to uh, say? Uh, uh, most of the antidepressants in the back, a black box um, on them that, you know, it says can cause suicide. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't seem to deter the doctor from prescribing them. Yeah, you know, no, no. And at one time, uh, I forget what the years were, but they got a kickback for them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that they made it a thing that works. I bet that's true. Yeah. They, they can't just stop taking them. No, they, they have to wean themselves off of them and such because it can um, well, they're, 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 yeah, yeah. And, and that's why you have to get a physician, uh, 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 their physician involved. Uh, one young lady that I was counseling um, was prescribed ketamine spray. You know, I've told you about the ketamine clinics in Tampa where you could just go, they IV you up. All right, she was using ketamine spray and she wanted off of them so i had to go back and tell her doctor that that she wanted off of that you know and so this physician did eventually wean her off of that but um but like and that was as i talked to her it was actually from what i could tell and from the doctor's notes it was more of an emotional addiction than a physical addiction. She just thought she had to have them, or she just put her face, you know, going out in the world, and it was just, so it was an emotional addiction. Yeah. I wanted to ask your perspective on how to talk generally about these things, because we probably all, there are probably people in our church family, probably people in this room who are on antidepressants or have them in some sort in their life. Um, we have had a dear family member who's been on the board for 30 years. Yeah. So, if it's a one how do you navigate a conversation and just without being like dismissive of what people have gone through and the advice and that they have received that they received and trusted and chose but to embrace? Like, how do you have the conversation respectfully? So, you have to ask the right questions. So, you have to say things like. Um, but not in a one on one. I mean, more like in the. Oh. In, like, Less one on one and more as talking about antidepressants. Like, how do you navigate as a person in society when that topic comes up? And you're in a group of people, you mean? Yeah. I mean, um, I'd love to know one on one, but I'm really right. curious how to just interact in society. Well, I, okay, so that's that's somewhat broad. I would need, I would need to know, like, what, what are they saying? What's, what's being said? So, and then, and then I could kind of start from there. Right, right. You, you certainly want to be gentle, uh, not judgmental or accusatory, um, but I think it would depend on what they were saying, and then I'd, I'd go from there. But I would ask a lot of questions and make them say what their thoughts and what their thinking is on it. So what I hear you saying is, is that correct? or? You know, so well, well then, well, how do you feel like they worked for you, or you know, you, you yeah. approach it that way? So that's a good, almost like you're drawing different chemicals to the toilet and just assuming this is going to happen. Yeah, and that's what you say. You say, well, you know, have you talked to your physician? See what they say when you ask that. Well, what did he say? What did you present to him? And so, you know, you have to do that. Let them talk a lot. Yeah, no, uh, the people, that's because that's their, that's their patient. They're saying they want off of them. And so I think when it works that way, uh, I've never had one come back and say, um, well, no, you know, or, or, you know, something horrible might happen to them. What it usually is, is, all right, well, I'll prescribe a lower dose for a while. And so they're still prescribing. They're just doing a lower dose. And sometimes it's probably a little longer than you think, you know, from talking to the counseling than they needed to. Um, but I've never had a really completely pushback. A lot of times these are so bad. Doctors you know, they don't even, they don't even you give like you more than five pages of information. These facts are so terrible. One of the things they ask you 
Oh, you said on the test. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Do you have, have uh, you know, a motion to make that? Do you think you need medication? I mean, it's just Bias, yeah, and it's right. Well, and not only that, but like, at some point, um, I noticed in medical records that, that they would be listed if they said they were sad for a short amount of time. Now that they're, they're listed as a mental illness, right? And so, also have to get the questioning it yourself and its its effectiveness and its the need for it just in in groups like this. That is that what you mean, like this as a not one-on-one, -on -one, but just yeah, right. But yeah, just. Um, but what point? Thinking that. Well, I've kind of been questioning. I've kind of looked into the research of that, and you know, I'm, I'm questioning that myself. The effectiveness and the need for it, and is it over? You know, just maybe saying those kinds of things would get somebody thinking. Okay. Well, I had a friend tell me that there's no way she would ever quit taking them. Mm -hmm. That there's no way she'd ever quit taking them. Probably because she's emotionally dependent and scared to, to come off. Yeah, and, and those are the key things that you pick up on. See, that's the way this lady was with the um, ketamine spray. Shanna, did you have a question? Are you always the person that calls and talks to the physician about like, getting on the medications or do they ever do it themselves? Yeah, they, I have definitely had them do it themselves. Okay. And then I, so that's what I was kind of wondering. I wonder yeah. if the doctor's getting a call from a counselor that says, Right. No, no. I, the, I'm ready to get off. They might be like, mm, there you go. Yeah, the patient, the patient has to go in there saying that's what they want. Because sadly, the psychiatrists view biblical counselors, they, right, almost in the, you know, like, like how we view them. In, right. And so there's a conflict there. So uh, it's, it's better if the patient goes in and, and says, you know, I want to cut that. the opposite of what you're thinking. She was thinking that you might gain more respect from the, but actually, it wouldn't be that way. From the doctor, you mean? That right. get more respect from the doctor? I just didn't know if they would see necessarily that you're like a physical counselor. If they would just say, like, oh, this is a counselor, and the counselors know if they need to, you know what I mean? Yeah. But then if it's just like the person. I have not had them. one counselee come back and give me one negative right. thing by me sending them, surprisingly. Yeah. yeah. And Doug, do you have a question? This is not a question. I just want to tell you experiences. I've had in the past as a police officer when I was on patrol. I can't tell you how many times I've answered calls where the person is in there, he's going crazy. He's destroying the house. He's on the TV out through the front window. He's doing it and he's violent. And the first thing they say is he's off his head. Mm -hmm. And so I assume that this was uh, this was an example of what this guy really needs so bad. He needs to get back on. Well, in later years, I thought back and thought, well, I wonder how much of that was, how bad he needed those meds for the fact that he took himself off all at once. Okay, thank you, because I was sitting here thinking, they will self-prescribe. I had, I had a lady in addiction, and um, she, would, she was telling me, well, you know, no, I, I'm not abusing my substances. Oh, you're not. Okay, well, are you taking them just like the label says? Well... No, I mean, I mean, well, if I miss one, then I take two. And I go, no, then, then, no, you're not following the label. So they don't understand that, and that's really important. Um, I think that stopping cold turkey yeah. may have been a lot yeah. of the reaction that we were seeing. Them yeah, because they just put cold turkey. Yeah, just set it down. Right, right, right. So we would never recommend that, and that's why, um, really, people in a real heavy addiction, if they're really, if they want help. Uh, sending them sometimes to a clinic because sadly to me sometimes the physicians won't be so cooperative but um, if we send if we can send them to a clinic I think you guys have a clinic that you have sent some people all right and, and it's worked right Heather mm -hmm. all right then but don't forget them after that because here's the problem the people that have been in addiction they've been in addiction so long that they do not know how to manage their lives so you'll get back a person that's that's clear of addiction, but they won't know how to manage their lives. So they actually need more, they need counseling to get that back in order. I worked with a lady who was an alcoholic for uh, 20 some years, and then she became sober, but yet I saw all the same meanness, and that she just wasn't drunk anymore. She, she, there was no alcohol in her, and she still wasn't 
managing her life responsibly. So, and I think that's because that became a habit in their addiction. So, being mean and ugly. Well, this particular one was. <laughs> I, have, I have heard of people that um, if they didn't do Christian um, counseling to get on alcohol, they might come within themselves quit drinking, but then they, their personalities would feel the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Well, I did see, I didn't know her before. I only knew her, um, like, yeah, like after, and she was just mean. So, any other questions? No? All right, did everybody turn their paperwork in? So I can speak to them next, next class. And I think next class is on fear. And then after that, we're going to go into temptation. So those are some good videos. Well. All right, Will, Ashley, will you close this and go? Okay. Uh, you are the God of all peace, and we confess that we need you. And we need you for ourselves, we need you for the situations we face, for the counseling that we provide. And I pray that we would remain focused on what you have to say and not on what we think feel, and that God, you would give us wisdom, help us to walk in peace, and not to worry about tomorrow, let's just know that it is going to be okay, because you're going to be with us, help us to really live